the great rock drummers. Bonham. Keith Moon. Dave Grohl. Matt Cameron. Ginger Baker. Mitch Mitchell. Brad Wilk. Chad Smith. Charlie Watts. Stuart Copeland. I could go on. Point is, they sound better than us. Aww. But why? If we really had to isolate what makes a pro rock drummer sound better than a beginner, could we say for sure? You might be tempted to say it's Chops, but then what about Ringo Starr, Charlie Watts, and Patrick Carney? What about people like Jeff Percaro, who had great chops but just hardly ever used them? No, there's a great deal more to what makes a pro rock drummer than just how flashy a solo they can take. And today, I'm gonna break it down for you. I'm gonna give you two broad categories of things pros do better than beginners, but we're gonna break them down into other things. It's gonna start off easy, and by the end, it's gonna be tough. I don't know if you can get through it. I'm genuinely curious to see what percentage of the audience can get through the exercises at the end. Anyway, on today's lesson, beginner drummer versus pro drummer, stay tuned. Guys, quick sponsor message. Today's lesson is brought to you by me, the 8020 drummer. And by sponsor, I mean I'm giving you something for free. The transcription to this lesson. If you'd like to get the free workbook that includes all the beats we talk about, just click the link below, enter your email address in on the next page, it's yours for free. Okay, the first thing we want to talk about is to dispel a myth. You guys maybe think that it's a particular kind of beat that pros play, or maybe they play more complicated. Let's talk about it. Now you might think the difference between a pro playing a rock beat and a beginner is the type of rock beat they play. Like maybe pros can play faster. Maybe pros can play more complicated or sophisticated beats. Now while that may be the case, in today's lesson we're not gonna talk about that at all. The concepts I'm gonna teach you apply universally to pretty much any rock beat you can play from something like this, which is a hundred million rock songs, but it just so happens I had Vertigo by U2 in my head. To something like this. Walk This Way by Aerosmith, right? Or maybe you fancy a little Zeppelin. Whether you're playing metal, folk rock, Tom Petty, or the Goo Goo Dolls, this is all going to apply. It's not so much the what you're playing, it's more about the how. In the rest of this lesson, I'll show you a few key concepts which, whether you're already a pretty advanced drummer or you're just a beginner, will help clear this up for you. Okay, now that we know what it's not, let's start to talk about what it is. Reason number one, pros sound better than beginners. So your sound on the drums has a few key components, but let's start with one of the most basic. When I used to play rock beats when I was a beginner, the sound I got from the snare drum was super inconsistent. And one of the biggest ways it was inconsistent was the rim shot. A pro rock drummer, regardless of their style, is gonna be able to make a consistent rim shot. How do we do that? Well, there are a couple of categories. First and foremost is the center of the drum rim shot, where the tip of the stick is in the dead center of the drum and you hit the shoulder on the rim at the same time the tip is hitting the center of the drum. This is your classic rim shot. You should be able to do it in a relaxed way, when I play it, typically there's a little bit of rebound, but my hand generally stays at the bottom. So that's your basic rim shot. And you want to be able to play that regardless of what you're doing with the other limbs. Mm -hmm. 
That doesn't mean you need to play the rim shot in every circumstance. You might be playing in the center of the drum on a quiet verse. But you definitely need to be able to cut when it's time for the chorus. The next element of the sound where pros differ a bunch from beginners, in my experience, is the balance. What do I mean by that? I mean your right foot, your lead hand, your backbeat hand. What's the balance there? Now I can tell you, depending on who you like, there are a bunch of ways to slice this enchilada. But if I were to pick the average rock beat, I would say most beginners play their kick drum too soft and their hi-hats too loud. So you want to kind of build this from the ground up. I like to play heel up, whether you play heel up or heel down, doesn't really matter. If you want a video on the technique of playing heel up, check here. But what heel up allows me to do is to drop the whole weight of my leg through the kick drum. And that allows me to project without spending a lot of muscle power. Like I'm just bouncing on my ankle there, that's projecting. Rule number two, to be broken frequently, is we want the hats to be a little bit lower in the mix than the kick and snare drum. It's a good thing to practice, at least. That's one that once you have the basic muscle memory, you can forget, because Dave Grohl on Smells Like Teen Spirit, come on. But once you've got that muscle memory to really dig into the kick, it'll be easier to play hard on the hats without drowning them out. The third huge difference in terms of the sound of the drum that I see between pros and beginners is what I call playing clean, which is when the kick drum and the hats are supposed to happen together, they really do, they're not When the hats and the snare drum are supposed to happen together, they really do. Basic beat to practice. Guess what? It's a rock beat. You can practice all of those things at once with that beat. Practice your voicing, make sure your kick is coming through. Practice your cleanliness, make sure when your lead hand and your kick are hitting together, they're together. When your lead hand and your snare hand are hitting together, or they're also together. These basic things, if you master them, as I said, they apply to basically any rock beat. In a second, we'll come back and talk about the other way that pros generally play better than beginners. So that's all well and good, but that's not the whole enchilada. If you want to know how drummers like Joey Kramer can play beats like Walk This Way, or Brad Wilk can play beats like Killing in the Name, There's more to it than just the sound and the touch. Let's check it out. Okay, now it's time to talk about the icky part of getting better at the drums that nobody wants to talk about, but it's a huge reason pros sound better than beginners. Think about it this way. If Joey Kramer was playing Walk This Way, do you think he'd play it like this? No, right? I'm not saying I'd do a great Joey Kramer impression, but my guess is he'd probably play it more like this. From the first part of the lesson, consistent rim shots, balance, playing clean, but also not speeding up or slowing down, right? Everybody talks about time, timing. It's much simpler than that. Don't speed up or slow down at first. When you get good, you can do it musically. Stuff can have a little lilt. I'm not saying you have to be perfect. You got another rule before you break it. So when Joey Kramer plays Walk This Way, he's got two things going on that are probably better than your average beginner. Oh, another great example. Brad Wilk, Killing in the Name. Very, very similar beat to Walk This Way, right? Same thing. Brad Wilk is doing two big things right that the average beginner, if you just started playing drums, probably wouldn't get as right. Okay, what are they? Number one, the distance between his subdivisions are consistent. So if you kept sixteenths on the hat, all 
all those 16ths would be about the same distance apart. And they keep that distance even when they're not playing every 16th. By the way, does that mean it needs to be robotic? No. It just means that it's more danceable. It's more predictable. A lot of times when you hear a beat that makes you want to dance as opposed to a beat that doesn't, that's the secret ingredient. And it's something that I call micro time, but that's kind of my nerdy drum nerd thing. Make it a rock lesson. We're not talking drum nerdy today, but it's micro time. The next thing is, even if your subdivisions are consistent, you can sometimes subtly speed up or slow down between the beginning of a song and the end of a song. And that's a rule that some great bands and great drummers break, particularly if you listen to some of the great bands of the 60s and 70s, the tunes will speed up. It sounds amazing. Trust me, it does not sound amazing when you or I do it. <laughs> we're not Mitch Mitchell. We're not Clyde Stubblefield. We don't get to just speed up or slow down until we know how to play the same tempo from the start of the song to the finish. Nerdy word for that, macro time. Macro meaning whole, big, so the time as a whole. Okay, enough nerdiness, let's talk about some exercises. Say we want to practice both types of time with a beat like Walk This Way slash Killing in the Name. Let's fire up the metronome machine. It's alive! Oh yeah. You like that? So that's your first thing, obviously, right? Play those sixteenths, make sure you can lock up with them. But now it's time to get a little more advanced. We're gonna play sixteenth offbeats. And if you have a fancy metronome, you can do this with that, but you can also do this with a basic metronome app where you just put it on eighth notes, but you shift your ear so that you hear it on one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a. Allow me to demonstrate. Couple reasons why we do this. When you play along with the 16th notes, that's all well and good, and it'll teach you where the distance between your subdivisions is inconsistent. So that's good, that's why it's a good first step. The problem is, when you get in a live situation, yes, sometimes you're gonna have a click check, great. A lot of times you're not. Particularly if you're kinda of coming up the ranks, playing in jam sessions, there's not gonna be a click track. You just agree on the beat. But the problem is you create the time with your playing so you don't get to follow. And drummers who only practice following the metronome sometimes have trouble when they need to create the time and lead the band. So by putting the metronome on the 16th offbeats, one E and a two E and a three E, you still get a reference point for where the time is and whether your subdivisions are fitting into that. But you don't get to follow, you have to lead. You have to make a guess about where the pulse is and then the metronome will check you. So that's why I love to practice with this this way. So that'll help you with the subdivision thing. The But you need a different exercise for your instincts about speeding up and slowing down throughout the whole tune. This is going to be the most advanced time exercise of this whole lesson. The last one. Let's take a quick message from our sponsor, then we'll come back. And guys, just a reminder, this lesson is brought to you by me, the 8020 drummer. What that means in practice is I'm giving you something for free. Pretty good sponsorship deal, right, Nate? I think it is. What are you getting? You're getting the complete transcription of all the exercises in this lesson. To get it, just click below, enter your email address in on the next page. We'll send it to you for free. That's it. Now on to the final exercise, the one which I'm not sure all y'all can play. Heck, I wasn't even sure I could do it. Are you curious? Let's see it. Okay, now we talk about how to keep your time consistent throughout the whole tune, the big phrase, so that if something is speeding up over the course of a chorus or a guitar solo, you have an instinct about that. And the way you do that is by having fewer inputs on the metronome. So we're going to switch it to beats two and four.
Practice that for a little while. It's easier to do with the metronome and your noise canceling headphones. When I do it live, sometimes the snare drum covers up the metronome. So you wanna make sure you can hear that metronome. Next exercise, last exercise. Oh, snap. Beat four, son, what? Two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Etc. That's the most advanced one. There are a lot of other things you can do, but if you can do these things, like from the beginning of the lesson all the way through to here, whew, your rock playing is going to go whew, whew, up and to the right. By the way, I don't know why people say up and to the right because everything goes to the right. That's just time. Like, so you really mean it's going to go to the right either way, but it's, as I was saying, if you're able to do this stuff successfully, your rock beats will go from beginner to <laughs> pretty advanced. Anyway, that's quite literally how you get the gig. Okay, you guys, hope you enjoyed that one. Were you able to get to the end? If you were, leave a comment below and let me know. What would be super great is if you guys posted some videos on Instagram and YouTube of you guys playing that exercise and just hashtag it 8020 challenge. That way I'll be able to find it. Anyway, dudes, it's been real. Always enjoy these. See you again real soon for another Last End of the Week.